So I want to welcome everybody to um, Celebration of Mind. Now it's time for this month's presentation, which is called The Magic of Polytopes, Mandalas, by Amina Bueller Allen. Um, Amina has been lecturing and facilitating hands-on math workshops at math conferences all over the world and in classrooms for over 30 years. And she also designs and manufactures beautiful math products, some of which are used in classrooms. For the last 15 years, she's been exploring polytopes. So um, Amina's gonna show us some really cool shadows among other things. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, history regarding polytopes and some of my personal history on the topic. And we'll do some terminology so that we have a basis for some understanding, I hope. And I'll be showing uh, quite a few pictures um, so that you can see what we're talking about. And I'll be showing some things live uh, using Zoom tool, which is a great manipulative um, to show the structure of higher space. Um, the best tool that I know of that you can use hands-on immediately. Um, anyhow, we'll start with some history. Um, back in 1852, um, a man named Ludwig uh, Schleifli, who's a Swiss mathematician, discovered the 120 cell, which is the four-dimensional dodecahedron. It's also called uh, the hyperdo or hyperdodecahedron. When you hear the word hyper in this context, it refers to higher space, anything beyond the third dimension. And we'll also go into what are the dimensions, uh, really. And the fourth dimension is not a time dimension. It has to do with it's a spatial dimension. And then we'll also answer a couple of questions, I hope, during this talk, which are, um, what are the lines that we're seeing in the shadows? And the big question, which actually led to my talk here today is uh, why are there three shadows for each model? Which is something I contemplated when I was living in four dimensional space, creating and fabricating a stainless steel um, 120 cell. And so I got to be rather intimate uh, with the structure and um, you fabricating it. I didn't have the luxury of a zone ball to show me which directions in space to go. So it was um, a challenge and it was a model which was over five feet in diameter. And if, you know, I was off say a thousandth of an inch in cutting the rod or anything, we would have been off, you know, more than six tenths of an inch to having it all fit uh, perfectly in the end. And um, so it was very nerve wracking, but uh, needless to say, it turned out beautifully. And it was a, a bit of a challenge, which I accepted. Um, the authority on this topic is actually Mark Pelletier, who is my husband and, and partner in our math endeavors. Uh, we did a lot of designing and investigating together. And he had made several of these um, while we were together. Um, and then after his passing, Roger Penrose asked me whether I would be able to make another one. And I told him that I could. Um, and so I went to work. And then I'll show you pictures of that build as well. Because um, I also think it's helpful to uh, see the progression as you're making these polytopes. Oh, and I should probably define what a polytope is. A polytope is a higher dimensional polyhedron, regular polyhedron. And by regular, uh, in the math context, it means that the edge lengths are equal. Now, in higher space, they are equal. But in our three-dimensional space, they will be foreshortened, like um, 
you know, when, when artists are drawing 3D space on a two-dimensional background, they might have to make, say, the length of your arm shorter to make it look real, to give that illusion of space on a 2D um, plane. So the, those are some of the elements that are necessary to make it realistic. And uh, one of the challenges, and it's a very sweet spot uh, in that in the 120 cell and the 600 cell, which is the hyper icosahedron, there are a lot of golden sections um, that you will be able to see. And it's just everything fits so beautifully, uh, which is the harmonic uh, for those particular um, models. So uh, back to Schleifli, he back in 1852, he discovered the 120 cell, like I mentioned, and um, it was new at that time. And by the 1880s, uh, math catalogs were carrying kits uh, that you could, you know, mail order, uh, and for lack of a better term, that you could order, and you could build these um, hyperdoses using either paper, um, wire, or rope. And then um, by the turn of the century or early in the 1900s, a lady named Alicia Bull Scott, um, who had no real formal math training, uh, was drawing a lot on Schleifli's uh, written work. And she um, had started a correspondence with Donald Coxeter who had written the book, uh, Regular Polytopes. He was at the University of Toronto and um, just wrote the most magnificent work on the higher dimensional regular uh, polyhedra, which are polytopes. Um, and so like I said, they were, he also corresponded with MC Escher, for example, he was a really, wonderful mathematician who promoted illustrating um, rather than just having numbers written on a page. So um, thanks to him, uh, we have a lot more uh, math being shown through hands-on and pictures. And then in the 1933, I believe it was, there was the uh, Century of Progress World's Fair. And there, there was um, a dis an exhibit by a gentleman named Paul Donchin, who was a model builder. And he had um, built um, a number of, the, of these polytopes. And they were absolutely beautiful. They are pictured in the book, Regular Polytopes, but those pictures are black and white. And the models themselves are absolutely beautiful. Uh, some of them are gold and silver. And then the inscribed on their surfaces are these beautiful patterns of the shadows that are cast. Um, they're just absolutely magnificent. They are at the Franklin Institute. Uh, and so upon request, um, they can be viewed. Um, but they hadn't been out for a number of years uh, when Mark and I uh, went to go uh, look at them. We have uh, regular polytopes. And then also uh, there's another uh, significant piece of literature that came out. Um, a lot of the, you know, sort of hippie movement. Um, there was these magazines called the Whole Earth Catalog. And those people put out uh, something called the Zone Primer, which was an oversized um, peer, uh, publication where uh, the 31 zone system was first introduced to uh, a greater audience. And Steve Baer was the, the person who discovered this. And he's also the person who coined the, the um, word zone, which was a contraction between zonohedra 
and a home. And he actually built his own home uh, uh, in a zone. And I can show that to you. So this uh, is a picture uh, from afar, as you can see now. I don't know how many of you might find this type of uh, clustering at all familiar, uh, but it is also uh, the way that bees uh, build their honeycombs. Uh, incidentally, um, it's a six dimensional cube. <laughs> so believe it or not, it's an efficient use of materials and bees instinctively um, can construct um, their spaces to store their honey uh, using these um, structures. And so, uh, and it's also the structure of a garnet crystal and it's a rhombic dodecahedron, which means that it's a dodecahedron, which has 12 sides, but it's made up of rhombuses, which are like a diamond shape um, and, rather than the pentagonal uh, dodecahedron. And so, um, this is his house in Corrales, which is near Albuquerque. And I just wanted to share that with you because um, actually some future talks will build on this zone idea, which he had. Uh, fast forward now uh, from the 1970s when uh, the zone primer came out to um, Mark Pelletier. So when Mark was 17, his high school burned down and they had to hold their classes in the library. And he discovered the, the regular polytopes books and uh, the zone primer. And he noticed that you could actually use one to build the other. So he was the first to put together that uh, you could use the 31 zone system to construct the regular polytopes. So we should probably go over what the 31 zone system is. And in order to do that, hopefully we'll learn a little bit about dimensions. There's a great book that was written some time ago uh, that's called Flatland that um, talks about the experience of a being visiting a uh, two dimensional space. And it was written as sort of like a children's story um, to illustrate concepts um, that could be more tangible than say a math book. Okay, so we have, um, if you imagine a point and we'll use the zone ball as a point, um, that is zero dimensional space. And then if you have two points, you can get a line and that is one dimensional space. And then if you go 90 degrees to that line and make another line, you get two dimensional space. This will give you a plane, which you can then cut up and slice up in many different ways. You can. Uh, make various polygons. So you can make a triangle, a square, a pentagon, um, whatever those, those are the, the building units in the two-dimensional space. Now in three-dimensional space, you go 90 degrees. Oops, where did I go? Here we go, 90 degrees to the two-dimensional plane. So you have length, width, and height now, and that gives us our three-dimensional world. Now to get to the fourth dimension, we have to go 90 degrees to this world, to this axis, and then you get the four-dimensional space and all it goes on up uh, to infinity, um, but uh, there's only so many objects that are possible as the dimensions go up. So rather than having there be more objects, there actually ends up being fewer. 
uh, which is interesting because beyond a certain point, all you get are basically cubes. All right, so um, that is the um, explanation. Oh, the zone ball decoded. Okay, so this zone ball, I hope that you can see it has 62 holes. And there's actually three different polygons in there. There is, it, hopefully you can see it, there's a rectangle. There's a pentagon. And if you can see, it actually goes all the way through, uh, but it's hard to see. That's So in other words, if we, we can put a rod all the way through, but I'll show you how to do that. And then there is a triangular hole right there. Okay, there are 12 pentagonal holes that represent the dodecahedron. There are 20 triangular holes representing the, the directions of the icosahedron. And then there are 30 rectangular holes, but these can also be square. Um, and that represents the tricontahedron, which has 30 sides. And the tricons are rather interesting uh, polyhedron as well, because uh, the cast shadows of that are actually Penrose tiles. And that is how Clark Rickert, uh, who's an artist that was um, working with Steve Baer, um, they helped uh, found Drop City which was an intentional community where they built these zone houses. Um, and he actually discovered the uh, Penrose um, shapes that everybody thinks of. Uh, so, and we, we, that could be a topic for another talk. All righty then. So hopefully that is the zone ball decoded. Um, Mark, and, and I should go backtrack here. Uh, Steve Baer had um, designed a something he called the zone toy, which was a just a round ball with a bunch of holes in it. And you could put sticks in there and they were in golden section and everything. But you could accidentally put the right stick in the wrong hole. So it was, it was really hard to build with. It was not user friendly, <laughs> even for those people who knew what they were doing, like Mark. And uh, Mark um, had discovered the solution that you could use this shape, the greater Rombi icosidodecahedron. Uh, as a way to force putting the right stick in the right hole. And then it was he and Paul Hildebrandt uh, who together uh, spent many years, I know they spent more than 10 and a half just working on creating the mold for the zone ball itself, uh, which is an amazing uh, achievement um, to be able to injection mold this piece. So imagine that they were told that it was impossible. I believe IBM told them that it was going to be a $3 million mold, uh, which would be impossible to make, but they thankfully did not accept impossible as an answer. <laughs> Anyhow, so what I wanted to say about these directions, so we had 62 holes, 62 holes, which gave us 62 um, you know, directions, but these holes, like when I held them up, you can see right through them. So they go straight through. So now you're getting, you know, one direction. So that's how we go from 62 down to the 31 directions and 31 zones uh, that Steve Bear uh, was talking about. Uh, my personal history, um, and I should uh, step back and say that both Mark and I were designing hands-on math products for classrooms. And we were both at an NCTM uh, meeting, annual meeting at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. 
and we both had booths and I was walking up the stairs carrying my color field sign and uh, uh, he stops me and says, hello, my name's Mark Pelletier. What's your name? And then it came to pass that he had developed a, a magnetic tiling product that had seven fold symmetry. And the one that I had with me was eight fold symmetry. And when my kids met him, they said, well, you two might as well be twins. <laughs> uh, and I also had a fascination with polyhedra. I was working with a young man who was an autistic savant who could build polyhedra. He could implode and explode them in his, in his mind. Uh, he knew the angle seconds and minutes um, instantly uh, looking at something and he could tell you uh, the number of shapes, the angle seconds and minutes of those shapes for every polyhedra he ever built. And because of this young man, I was always looking for materials uh, to teach him more uh, and there was, you know, a real shortage of that. So when I went to any math uh, conference at all, I would ask, you know, who's the polyhedra person? Well, at the end of the NCTM show, and that's National Council of Teachers of Math, um, uh, Dale Seymour, who had um, some of the most magnificent math catalogs, uh, was throwing a party at his house. and. Um, so there I was asking people, well, who do I talk to about polyhedra? Well, Mark's name came up at least five times. And I thought, wow, you know, how, how this is just amazing. This guy must really know something. And sure enough, it was the Mark Pelletier who had introduced himself on the steps. And so he told me, he says, well, if you're ever out to Colorado, please, you know, come by and see my polyhedra museum. <laughs> and so I, um, I was commissioned by Jay Bonner and Michael Barron on a magnetic tiling project, um, putting uh, geometric uh, designs on polygons as a tiling product. And they're magnificent. They're Islamic geometric tiles. Um, and they were in Colorado at that time, and they asked me to come out so they could teach me what I needed to knew, know to produce their product. And so that brought me out to Colorado, and I went to see Mark, and then we realized we had a lot more in common and didn't need to explain things to each other. So we got along famously, um, got together, and um, combined our polyhedra collection and our math books, which you see in back of me. Um, and so it was really a wonderful dream. So I'm grateful that we met. Uh, so uh, Mark, I had had the book regular Polytopes and also Kundi and Rollet, which were a couple of the books that Mark just found very fundamental. And I found it really fascinating that he had them on his bookshelf because I hadn't met anyone else who had these books on their bookshelf. And so, uh, I, needless to say, um, it, it was just amazing to uh, find somebody with similar interests. And he's the one who introduced me deeper into polytopes. Like I said, I had Donald Coxeter's book, uh, but it was pretty much, you know, words and pictures, and I didn't quite get it. Um, I just, there was some fundamental things missing there. And thankfully for Mark, he helped um, enlighten me as to what these shapes are really all about. Okay, so, and then people started asking me to lecture because they wanted to know more about four-dimensional space. And also let me, let me mention something else about 4D space or anything that's coming down from the higher dimensions they're into the lower dimensions. Those are called projections. They're also called slices because it's like a slice of a space. 
um, and it and it's their shadow. Now it's interesting because we have a shadow. Our three dimensional self has a two dimensional shadow, but a four dimensional object has a three dimensional shadow, which might be a little bit much for the mind to grasp, but it's pretty incredible. So we can actually build what a four dimensional object is in 3D space, even though we can't go to four dimensional space. So I think that's a really cool aspect that allows us to investigate some of these higher space um, ideas and hence this hyper talk. So here's the beginning of the construction of the hyperdough, uh, the stainless steel uh, one that I made. So the, the beginning of it is this regular. And when I say regular, it means it has all equal sides. Um, so this is a regular dodecahedron and it's in the center of the 120 cell. Um, and I should also say that regular also means that um, the polytopes in the higher dimensions, they all have equal lengths. So in the title, regular polytopes means that all of those shapes have equal lengths on their edges. So um, I can assume that everybody knows what an edge is. Uh, what a vertice is, uh, which would be the corner, and then the face. But we'll go over we'll go over that in a more fundamental way. So there's the the core, the center is the dodecahedron, and then uh, you build these. They're actually squash dodecas around them. So there's only one regular dodecahedron in the whole 120 cell, and so here it's building. And I was trying to triangulate so that the thing wouldn't collapse because there's no triangles in it. Wow. And this is the outer shell. So you have to uh, work on the center and there's like layers, like an onion uh, of, of different dodecahedra. And then this is the outermost layer and the that outside shape. And I don't know if you can see my cursor here, this, Yes, it's see. actually a completely flat dodecahedron. And so that that would represent an entire dodeca. OK, so here's another view of the shell coming together, the outer shell. Here it's getting a lot bigger. It's getting to the point where we actually need three people <laughs> to hold it. And, and like I said, if, if we're off at all, by a thousandth of an inch, that accumulated error means that the whole thing wouldn't fit together. Now, I'm unlike Mark in that I cannot tell you the exact, you know, degrees the on an angle, the degrees, minutes and seconds of what I'm holding. Mark could just hold something up and be unbelievably accurate. I, however, uh, and everybody else that I was working with to help me on this project. Well, we decided to make some jigs. Uh, and where's my cursor? Ah, there it is. Uh, make some jigs so that we could actually fit the shell uh, into the outer thing. So there's the, the other jig. Okay, so there is the inner core uh, before the shell gets added. And I'm showing you this because um, hopefully as you see it being built, it'll help you to kind of decipher it. It's hard to see a 3D object in 2D space. So I'm hoping that um, through looking at it through different views, uh, you'll get a spent, uh, sense of its 3D uh, uh, structure. So here it is almost completely together. And that now, I don't know if you noticed, but we had these support rods through there. Um, that was to make sure that things would remain straight. As I said, there's no triangles in this entire structure. So I didn't want it to bend or anything, even though it was stainless steel. And oh, there's my cursor. 
Okay, so there, there it is. And it's hanging uh, by compression, but from one of the, it's lower uh, layers there. Okay, and here it is. Uh, we're loading it up to go to the electro polisher. Um, I like these pictures because with the street light, you can kind of really see some of the structure, which was hard to see in the machine shop with all that clutter around. Uh, hopefully you noticed some of the models that were in the background. Uh, so this should also give you a sense of the size of the object and things are starting to line up here. Um, and this is the electro polishing is to make it all nice and shiny because when you weld, there'll be hot spots where the scale and impurities in the steel will rise to the surface and also the heat will discolor the metal. And the electro polishing is like a, dipping it in a big tank and it strips away all that outer layer so that it's actually very nice in the end and clean and no hot spots or variation in the color. And now I did have some other pictures, but I had to kind of edit them where I zoomed in where you could see how nice and beautiful and clean that these joints are. And like I said, this was um, this is what it looks like now to this day, because uh, actually the buyer uh, had to back out um, before it was shipped. Uh, at least it hadn't gone out yet. So it, it needs a new home. Here is, um, okay, so we're gonna now start hope, hopefully developing your eye uh, to see some of these, uh, uh, things, concepts that I'll be talking about. So I'm using the cube here because a lot of people are familiar with the cube. It's a shape that people are relatively comfortable with. I, we live in them. Uh, so most of us have a, a pretty good understanding of what a cube is. So here is a cube um, where I'm putting it in the sun. And with, with uh, this is a fa face first projection. So I'm holding it such that you're just seeing the building unit of the square, which, okay, so the face is the build, the, the square is the building unit. And here, this is with it, the sun focused around the vertice or corner. And notice here, so this ball here, is right here in the center. So it's this ball and both these balls here lined up to make that point. So now we have six equilateral triangles within a hexagon. And then most of you can also see the cube at the same time. Okay, so that, like I said, so we went from a square to a hexagon. And this is um, what happens when you uh, when you line it up with the edge, the edge of, and actually it would be this edge here uh, with the sun. And this will give us the sort of bilateral symmetry or mirror symmetry. So it's you know sort of like a bookend where one side mirrors the other. And I'm showing you these because it's significant in terms of what are we looking at when we're gonna be looking at these more complex shadows. So here's a dodecahedron and the projection of its face first. And this is the shadow that we get. So if you notice on the outside here, we have a 10 gone. And then this internal part here are the two overlapping pentagons because they're actually, you know, one is completely reversed 180 to the other one. And so it makes this beautiful shape in here. Um, so this also, this decagon, um, I, I'm gonna have you notice it um, during the build of the zone tool, uh, 120 cell. So here is the edge first projection that, that mirror uh, there on the dodeca. Oh, and I lost 
the vertice. I don't know if I deleted it or just forgot to uh, it, okay. These are really upload. Cool. Anyway, so uh, we don't have that, but I wanted to show you these here, these two, regardless, uh, because if we get to it, this um, will have significance on something uh, called ornament or decoration. Uh, when we get to Claude Bragdon, who is uh, another uh, very wonderful uh, person when it comes to higher space. So uh, this, if you notice, this is flat here and flat here. So at the same time, you could get those. Uh, but here, the top and bottom, you have a barrel shape and you can see both the top and bottom, which is quite odd, really. I mean, how many objects can you really see where you can see both the top and bottom? So that's almost has an illusion of 40 space. Okay, sorry, didn't mean to go over it again. All right, here we have the 120 cell, which is the one in back, the hyperdodecahedron uh, there, uh, 4D dodeca. And here is the 600 cell, which is the um, four-dimensional icosahedron. And these two are related to each other because um, they're duals, but I don't know if we'll get to what a dual means. Uh, but basically one is kind of inside of the other. So now we're looking at the 120 cell. This is one view. Uh, here's another view. And this is just, you know, walking around it. Here's another view. And here in this, um, on the side here, I am showing the layers. So if you recall uh, in, this, in this sculpture build, I started with the regular dodecahedron in the center. So the, here's the regular dodecahedron. And then I'm showing the various dodecas that are around uh, the, this particular model. So this, Dodeca here is a little bit squashed uh, through foreshortening in 3D space. And then there's um, two other uh, dodecas here, which are squashed even further. And then one uh, on the very outer layer, uh, which is squashed completely flat. And I, that's what you saw on the shell of the uh, build of the 120 cell. Okay, so yeah, I'm just yeah. gonna flash through. That's good because we're actually getting through. And these are the dodecas that, that those, um, so here is the shadow of um, the 120 cell. That's the 510 shadow. Um, and then like I said, the video is gonna show this. This is the, the mirror symmetry uh, two four. And here is the six. Wow. Okay, and I'm just like I said, flashing. It's actually them. impressive just zooming through these. <laughs> well, that's what I was gonna do, yeah. and that's the wow. that was the 600. Here are the shadows of that. Um, mm -hmm. We are also gonna. I'm also gonna show the 6D cube, and this was Mark's last uh, zone model that he built. And in order to make it, he had to design this part for where. Uh, the struts or the lines would have intersected. And what we're seeing, speaking of lines, uh, here we're repairing, that's the model. Wow. And, um, because I really don't need to focus on them at all. And that is the tree of life. How odd is that? Oh, sorry, that's a, that's a tesseract or four dimensional <laughs> cube. That was one of my grandkids. Uh, yeah, this, yeah. this was a workshop that a man named Sandy Candle did with some children in, I believe, Los Altos, California. And he sent these pictures um, and I was just amazed and wanting to share them because this was really some amazing shadows uh, that he made. And then these two are, that would be for another talk, uh, 2D representations of shadows. And this is a, uh, another person uh, here. And this will be conversation of another talk. This is a polar zone uh, in two dimensions that's sevenfold. Here's the polar zonohedron that's popping into 3D space 
with the two dimensional geometry in it. Um, the floor, okay, so the ceiling is 3D, the floor is 2D, and yet the patterns line up perfectly, which is amazing. Wow. And that's just trying to show that. And there we go. Uh, now we are to the video. So this is the 120 cell, the hyperdough, the four dimensional dodecahedron. And just watch as the magic happens. And what amazes me is, you know, there's just a bunch of jumbling chaos until all of a sudden, That's there fine. it goes, it all lines up. So we're going from three different symmetry groups, all from one object. I'm here, we're at the 600 cell. All right, here we go. All right, there we have it. That's so beautiful seeing the chaos above and the symmetry below. I can see why you call it magic. Wow. All right, thanks for bearing with me. And I'm really happy that people were wowed because I'm wowed every time. I just think it's some of the most amazing uh, real life magic that happens, so. Hopefully some people want to investigate. Well, thank you again, Amina. And thanks everybody for coming. Thank we you for the opportunity to share.